Hello everyone and welcome to the Great Gundam Project, episode 86. I am Jackson, I'm joined by M. this is the Gundam Podcast. Hello M. It's Gundam time. Hi, uh, we're here to talk about Gundam. We are joined by a special guest today. Uh, we're joined by Austin Walker. Hello. Hi. Hello. I'm here to talk about Hi. Gundam and robots and other anime, probably. Uh, it's going to be good. If you are a first-time listener, uh, which you might be, because this is an episode that goes up on YouTube, as we do for our free episodes, uh, this is a podcast where usually me and Em, but today we've got Austin here to talk about Victory Gundam. Uh Go through Gundam two episodes a week. That's the premise of the show. That's all we do. <laughs> <laughs> and it has become a, a life... Uh, uh, what's the word? Just a big thing. Just a burden. What's Oh, a burden. A burden. I'm thinking of a, a burden. I was going to go with Magnum Opus. <laughs> My too. burden works just as well. <laughs> <laughs> that's just uh, that, that's a little uh, peek into this. But yeah, no, we are now at Victory Gundam, so this is the, you know, 86th episode, that means 86 weeks, I guess. Uh, we only took two weeks off, so yeah, almost two years of this. Whew. Yeah. It adds up. Uh, it's good. People who are listening to this episode, one, you should keep listening to this one, because we're going to talk about Victory Gundam, which is a Gundam that I've never seen before. Never seen, uh, yeah. So this is like fresh takes uh, on this, the first two episodes of this. But also, people who are listening should go back and listen to the rest of Great Gundam Pro- Project. Um, I am all the way caught up on it at this point. I listen to it every week religiously. Um, if you are someone who, for instance, likes to uh, take media pretty seriously, even though it is like aimed at a young audience, or likes to look at like uh, shows that are about like you know cool robots, but are like, wait a second, is this show doing something else? Also, do, do, do go back and listen because I think Emma Jackson do an incredible job of digging into the politics and philosophy and history of Gundam and like even though it is their first listen they bring uh, like a, a for real expertise to it that does not come from being that sort of like deep lifelong fan that comes from being a fan of things like history and culture and politics and then being like hey what's up with these robots um, so seriously go back and listen at this point it's what y'all have done everything up until Victory Gundam. So all of the original yeah. Mobile Suit Gundam, all of Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam, Double Zeta, uh, 0080, uh, yes. War in the Pocket, 0083, Stardust Memory. What am I missing? I'm missing a Two big Two movies one. and SD Two Gundam. Movies. <laughs> right. SD Gundam, which I will always forget. <laughs> we also watch SD Gundam, yeah. Char's Counterattack. Uh, Wait, what's the other? Oh, F91. F91. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 Apologies to F91. Um... <laughs> This is only the beginning. Okay. <laughs> this is only the beginning. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, that's really kind. Thank you very much. If you are listening and go, wait, why can't I listen to this podcast? It's because it uh, started and still is a Patreon show at patreon.com slash real mapping. Uh, this is a free episode at uh, on YouTube or just the Patreon website, wherever you're listening. And um, if you subscribe at $1 a month, it's only $1 a month. Uh, that's pretty cheap. That's very Patreon cheap. Stuff. Uh, you get uh, one episode every week, and we talk about this stuff. And yeah, uh, Austin is right. You can literally watch like our understanding of the politics of this form in real time. <laughs> if, you, if, if you listen to this and then go back and think our takes sound pretty different early on, yeah, this is a journey. <laughs> it's a whole thing. God. Uh, on top of that, uh, when we do series, we do backup shows. Uh, when we oh, God, it, right. Starting with Zeta Gundam, or double Zeta Gundam, because we weren't sure we were going we to like it, because everyone told us it was the bad one. Uh, we started <laughs> doing backup shows, and we watched Armor Trooper Bottoms. Uh, when we watched Stardust Memory, we watched uh, Armor Hunter Mellow Link, which just finished. And starting today and going through Victory Gundam, we are watching the original Macross, uh, starting with Super Dimension Fortress Macross and going forward into other shows. So we'll be covering two episodes of that also today. Uh, I have full summaries because Macross honestly has more going on in it than Gundam does this week. So uh, <laughs> yeah, fair no, enough. It's gonna be a going to be a pretty uh, big episode. Uh, so unless anyone has any anime they particularly want to talk about, we'll just get into it. I would like I, I would take, like to talk about a little bit of an, uh, a manga actually. Okay, hit me. I know what this is. Uh, I'm doing radio. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> so I started reading, uh, or I read the first volume of Saint Young Men, which is a uh, manga uh, written and drawn by Hikaru Nakamura, uh, which uh, ran in, still running in the magazine Morning 2 in Japan uh, from 20, 2006. It's like 16 volumes long. The first volume just came out in America digitally like two weeks ago, uh, because this is a story about... Uh, 
actual Jesus and actual Buddha deciding to take like a skip year and live together in an apartment in Tokyo after the millennium's all settled and everyone survived. Uh, and they're just going to chill out and live life and understand how humans live. Uh, you know what? Shout out to them. They deserve it. You know, yes. they should really yeah. take, take time to yourself, self care, you know? Uh, yes. Uh, Jesus is the person who just loves life and always spends rent on like costumes and hobbies. Uh, <laughs> Buddha is the responsible one who will make sure everything's clean and the food gets cooked. Basically, um, they're they're good. Uh, that's, that's a good pairing. Uh, this uh, manga is like really really famous. It's like it's sold sixteen million copies, whatever. Uh, but the Kudansho refused originally to license it to the West because they were afraid that it would offend people by mm. being about Jesus. Um, but now you can get the first volume. Uh, it's really good. Uh, it's got like a, it's got got, got a anime. It's got a live action movie. Um, I'm glad this is finally coming over. I hope that it, it continues to come over. I don't particularly like buying uh, digital manga. I want it on my shelf. That's who I am. But uh, happy to support this one. It's very cute. If you go to my uh, Twitter, I have a bunch of screenshots of this. Um, I'll link to the thread maybe in the notes of this episode. Um, I just wanted to take a note here from the Wikipedia page in the description in the overview. It says, while Jesus is portrayed as an impassioned person for his for his love for all, and his love for all is a link out to the the great commandment, uh, <laughs> aka, love thy neighbor as thyself. And then it continues, and then in parentheses, even for shopping. And then because it is Wikipedia, <laughs> shopping is also some sort of link out. So, love it. Oh, that's amazing. Great. That's amazing. Great. Good. Uh, Austin, do you have anything you want to talk about? Or I we don't. Get Let's just get into it. Let's yeah, get into that's it. Fair I, this has been my, we're my all entertainment. We're very busy. <laughs> yeah, we're all very busy and also eager to talk about New Gundam. Not yeah, New Gundam. Not new Gundam. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they announced a really good, real great New Gundam that I might pick up uh, just Did this they? past week. So, yeah, Ooh. it looks really awesome. I'll send you a picture when we're done. All right, cool, cool, cool. <laughs> Episode one of Mobile Suit Victory Gundam is called The White Mobile Suit. I wonder what mobile <laughs> suit that could be. It's a Gundam. <laughs> it's a Gundam. Mobile Suit Victory Gundam is a brand new show. It aired in 1993. It is the uh, final Universal Century show from Yoshiki Tomino. It's followed up by G Gundam without Tomino. Uh, so it is like kind of his last hurrah, and also everyone hates it. So we're in for a good time. Uh, I'm very curious oh. to see how we end up feeling about it. He um, does other Gundam shows in the future, but but not like UC yes. shows, right? So... It's so turn A and um, G Record, yeah, okay. both of which I th I like Turn A. Um, I still have to finish Turn A, but I really like the first half of it, which is what I've watched. And I watched all of G Reco and I like G Reco a lot. And uh, you will hear lots of people in whatever in seven years, whenever you get to G Reco, <laughs> um, people will tell you it's a bad one. But I'm 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 a fan of G Reco, so I'm hoping that that also means I'll like Victory. But I have I have my doubts. We'll see. We'll see how it ends up going. Yeah. Uh, and yes, this uh, one of the other things important to know is that well, there's some production troubles early on in this show. Um, this is an episode that has been edited strangely. Like they finished some of the episodes, I think was how it went down to the specifics. But uh, and then. Um, Sunrise was all... Some form of the production was like, why isn't the Gundam in this episode of Gundam? Uh, so they had to kind of re-edit the start of the series. <laughs> Uh, which you'll understand how <laughs> in a moment as we get into the summaries of these two episodes, uh, which is probably a good time to um, pass on to M. Uh, yeah, so this first uh, summary is a mess, but I think it's an appropriately representative mess. So we'll just we go. didn't make the mess. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just I'm just reporting on the mess that was given to me. Uh, so we start with a narration like Gundam because we're back to Gundam. Uh, and we are told that mankind went to space for an era, as depicted in F91. Uh, war happened anyway, as again depicted in F91. Uh, the narrator <laughs> helpfully says, if people can't bring themselves to believe that they can live in space, mankind's history will be a tragic one. I love this because the thing, the, I've, I have a note here that is just italicized the word believe. It's if people can't bring themselves to believe they can live in space, Mankind's history will be a tragedy when they're already living in space, but somehow yes. we just don't believe it yet. Like, and that is super interesting. I'm so curious to see if the show continues to like play on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the the show's entire premise being just the, the most literal extension of the like uh, metaphor about Earth gravity is yeah. very good. Yeah. Uh, so yes, instantly from the opening lines, I'm like, yeah, I'm in. Let's go. <laughs> 
Uh, we immediately pan to Earth and a battle in progress as a boy fights our fake Char here wearing a white ninja mask head sock straight out of the 90s. Uh, they are both yes. in mobile suits. Uh, the boy's mobile suit gets its ass beat until he ejects and the suit explodes. He crashes through the forest. Uh, the red mobile suit uh, le leaves the boy for dead, takes off with the orange suit. Uh, the boy, his name is Uso. He is our main character here. He's in the forest looking at a snail, wondering how he got into all this mess. Uh, they talk about Vespa, which I know is supposed to be Vespa, but they didn't... They translate it with a B, even though their whole thing is that it's supposed to be like wasps. But don't ask me. Yeah. Full burner. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's, it's tough. It, you know, mm, I'm, I'm, I, I'll give it to them anyway. I've looked it up. They have a cool logo that has a wasp. Like They do have a cool. No, and specifically, I feel like they should have translated as Vespa in the, right. like, when they brought it over yes. to America. Yes, that's Cause, fair. Yeah. Yeah. Because it, it doesn't read as the Vespa, even though like a Japanese speaker would automatically know what they're doing there. Yep. Yep. Uh, the, we find out there's a bunch of bombings and a ship called the Camion, I guess. Uh, they're waiting for diapers because there's a baby in Gundam because there's a bunch <laughs> of kids standing around and one of them is holding a baby. Uh, <laughs> we're back. Yep. yep. Uh, there's a baby. There's a dog. There's a Haro. There's a lot of good <laughs> stuff happening. <laughs> there's three mascots. Yep. Oh, uh, everyone's sitting around wondering what to do, and uh, the, like, main... I, I suppose she's the leader? I don't know. This lady, her name is Marbit. She gets in the core fighter, and she's going to go off and look for Uso over the uh, objections of all of the mechanics standing around doing nothing. Um, she seems a, cool. Yes. She does seem cool. Um, we cut to a big city that's uh, all been bombed and smoldering. It looks like it's in Eastern Europe. Uh, Wikipedia helpfully tells me it's Eastern Europe, but I could tell. Um <laughs> this is the city of Uig. Uh, Jackson, yours is Wuig, right? Yes. How? Because we have different. I, the older subtitles are worse. Okay. Yes. Uh, there's there's one specific difference in the subtitles in episode two that like completely changes the entire meaning of the whole show. Oh wow! Uh, I don't know if that's true, but it does give a different spin on things. Uh, we see this blonde woman named uh, Miss Katagina. We don't really know her deal throughout the these two episodes. <laughs> Haven't come around to it yet. We do uh, know that she said, "I'm glad Uig was." bombed like this because the privilege to live in the special quarter were all corrupt and yes, their eyes narrow yes i did just that's my next line so thank you for okay, that good. Uh, <laughs> incredible uh, um, she does mention that it's like a place called lagrain lagrain so i don't know we haven't met that place yet yeah. and then she's like i'm really glad that shakti or Susie aren't here to see the bombings um shakti is uh the young girl who's like uso like uso's childhood friend um so that's great uh they are looking for a map to a factory and they find it in the middle of a corpse pile of yeah. corpses uh, i would like to make a note here that i wrote down when i was looking at the wikipedia uh they originally asked Tomodo to make this show to capitalize on SD Gundam's popularity with children, and this is the show he gave. <laughs> oh my god! Uh, yeah, no, I mean he's much younger. This is uh, yeah, this this like thirteen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's the youngest protagonist we've had. So, mm. uh, this this is the exact same thing that happened with Batman Beyond, though. To be fair, they asked fair. them to make a the show for kids, and they made the much darker show. <laughs> god. Anyway, they find the map on this one person, and they're like, oh, of course he would have brought this with him as he was, like, killed and thrown in this corpse pile. But it's exactly what we need. Um, we cut to Marbit in the core pilot. Uh, let's see. What do I want? Oh, um, Uso basically creates, like, a like a trebuchet to launch his jacket up onto the core fighter to get her attention, um, which is very good. It's remarkably uh, well aimed. Yes, He's, she lands. She lands the plane and then passes out due to an injury that we are not informed about until next episode. <laughs> yeah, I was very confused. I I went into the next episode being like, maybe she has like a fear of landing. Like she's flying okay, <laughs> but is she just. I was, bad I was like, maybe she's sick. <laughs> right. Yeah. There is a line earlier on about her leg. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Good. Well, a million things are happening. There was a, like, already by that point, I'd heard someone in a, a head sock say the yeah. color of that jumper. It's the boy who jumped into my cockpit. And like, who are you talking about? What is happening? happening? 
Yeah. God. Yes. The part where it wasn't written to be that way, but then it ends up being like a weird. Uh, a, all the consequences happen after the effects. No, wait, shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I can't talk. But yeah, that's no, very funny. Uh, so we we cut again to a very fancy like Air Force base or whatever, and this is where the bad guys are, the fake Zeon, um, and uh, Mister Headsock himself, who is named Chronicle Asher. Yes, uh, same, Domino's same. back. <laughs> yeah, good is, name. It, is answering to a like Lieutenant Dupree and a woman named Fuala Griffin. Um, <sighs> And getting yelled at for not, like, did you actually take care of uh, the League Militaire, which are the bad guys? Uh, and he's like, well, I shot down a child. And they're like, that's not what we asked about. <laughs> <laughs> this could be every Gundam show. Um, yes. <laughs> I just want to compliment Griffin's look. She has pink hair. She has, like, a cool red inner shirt. And then, like, you know, golden epaulets and the OD green. And then just, like, a circlet. Like, as if yes. she was playing a fantasy RPG and needed to increase <laughs> her magic score. It's great. Uh, that's the aesthetics. <laughs> there really are. Um, everyone in Uig finds Gundam parts in a factory. Um, Katagina's surprised that they took the risk of just like building them all here. And a guy explains that they built a bunch of different Gundam parts all over the city in various factories. So if one of them got destroyed, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. Uh, and they are doing this all in an effort to use League Militaire's military action to stir the Earth Federation to care about the uh, being invaded by Abesva. Good luck! Uh-huh. <laughs> God. We're here again already. The corrupt politicians of the Earth Federation don't give a fuck about regular people. Uh, yeah, but also we have just the AUG, but even more clueless. Uh-huh, yeah. Um, Uso and Marbet take off. Uh, she's instructing him on how to use the core fighter. Uh, the boy is preternaturally good at piloting ships. Oh, Really? Interesting. Yeah. Is that about? there another word you might use to describe that? Or uh, later, later oh, okay. they bring okay, up we're later. Not there yet. Not okay. Okay. <laughs> Two uh, more paragraphs. Know, has, has he been comprehending the nature of things? <laughs> no, absolutely not. <laughs> Um, she explains that the core fighter can turn into Gundam parts, and so Uso turns on the head part, so the head <laughs> is just sticking out of the core fighter, uh, making it like shake from the drag as they fly around, just for fun. Yep. Right? Like, it's just, yeah. like, that's what I would do if I had a, if I was in a, a fighter jet that had a Gundam head in the back. I'd just Absolutely. make it pop up. It looks cool. Yeah, um, she's like, we'll fall down. He's like, well, then we'll just go faster. <laughs> Got me there. Yeah. Uh, Shakti is waiting by a radio for a call. She's, like, falling asleep. Uh, she has the dog with her and Haro. Um, she gets a call from someone named Count, and I have here, is that a person or a title? It's, it's a name. Uh, the guy's name is Count. <laughs> Oh, he's okay. not a count? I, I, okay. I knew I, people called him I, count. They, keep, I they kept... keep calling him count, but he's just a mechanic, so I assume that his name is count. Interesting. Okay. Um, she turns on signal lights to guide the core fighter into the garage, uh, and then they're like, as soon as it lands, cut the light short because we're in enemy territory and hidden here. Um, Usa lands the core fighter. We now find out that Marvin has an injured leg, or Jackson already knew, so... Um, <laughs> Uh, we Asher is going back out in to track down all of the League Militaire. He puts back on the ninja mask as he mentions how much he hates the air on Earth. He's like, how could you breathe this stuff? It's garbage. Uh, <laughs> That's a good reason to wear a mask. It's a good reason immediately to be like, we need a mask character. Which, oh yeah, the Earth sucks. <laughs> That's yes, why. Uh, Asher wants them to launch his suit, and uh, he's like in the like first like the core fighter part, and then he tells them to launch the boots, and you're like, "What's boots?" Uh, <laughs> and we're about to find out what boots is. Um, Dupree gets a call as he's like, he's he clearly just woke up. He got like four hours of sleep. He's having a coffee in his bathrobe and gets a call. <laughs> Asher's already out there fighting mobile suits. Like, ah, shit. Uh, he wants so... his boots, sir. <laughs> like, <laughs> okay. Yep. As uh, everyone comes in, we meet a bunch of other mechanics and older people. Um, Marbit then thinks about new types. So like, ah, oh, I've always heard about this mysterious thing called a new type. And it's like, yeah, I know. <laughs> no one remembers the legend of the Gundam 30 years ago. <laughs> um, yeah, so like, how far away are we at this point from 30 F-91? years from F-91. 30 years from F-91. And F-91 was how long from 
30, 30 years from Shaw's Counterattack, okay. I think. Yes. 60 years, so I, I guess. I think this is 60 uh, years since uh, the Shaw's Counterattack stuff would okay. have been 15, 17 Thir- 13, years after Wonder Woman? 13 years after... Oh, uh, I forgot. <laughs> yeah. Follow-up question. Um, how far was New Hope from Order 66? 19 years. <laughs> See? G- g- just like that. <laughs> it's just like that. Boom, done. That's the so, that's the, the number you cor- need. Correct, but I hold Gundam to a higher standard than I hold Star Wars. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> Absolutely fair. Also, um, remember when Seabook was like, after we get done with this battle, we can go around and force everyone to become a new type. I do remember <laughs> that. I guess that didn't work. Did that not? No. Did you? So wait, wait, wait. <laughs> did the two of you read the follow up manga after said after F ninety one at this point? So I've read, I've read, I've read two volumes of Crossbone, and let me tell you, nothing to do with F ninety one. Okay, good or victory, presumably. No, it it takes place in Jupiter. It's about a thing in Jupiter. <sighs> cool. So. Yeah, no, I hope I'm, things are I'm, good I'm, in Jupiter. <laughs> things are bad in Jupiter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it's actually I. So I've heard that the like Tomino gave them a bunch of notes for the setting of Crossbone, and then like they used those, and then eventually started drifting into just telling a manga story, which I bet is bad. Right. But the way in which the universe is set up around Jupiter is a nice wrinkle in the world of Gundam that I wish was actually in some of these shows. Because uh, Jupiter sucks, and being a space noid when you're not in Earth's sphere is a bad thing to be. <laughs> Fair. Because uh, they're all very unhappy. I bet. Uh, okay, so Asher's flying around looking for League Military. He spots a bunch of trucks, and he's like, hmm, they shouldn't be out here, uh, and begins to attack the patrols. Everyone scrambles. Uso goes out because Marbit's injured. Uh, Asher confronts Uso's core fighter, and they dogfight. Uh and then uh, Asher starts firing missiles, and Uso's uh, amazed that he would just fire, like, missiles at him in a dogfight because they're meant to be fired at, like, bases and not people. Mm. Um, uh, sh- we cut to Shock T feeding the baby. A baby's good. I'm just going to note the baby doing things. Uh, it's the best part of F-91 brought forward. A baby. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so they launch out uh, the boots for Uso, which we find out are just the bottom half of a Gundam or a mobile suit. Uh, but it misses and they, it gets shot down. He's like, oh, we need new boots. So uh, <laughs> they they get uh, new boots. They shoot them out and he sets the balancer of his ship to V mode and they auto dock and turns into a goddamn Gundam. Ash is very surprised to see a Gundam there. Um we see everyone on the ground on like hover bike, like hover speeders, like it's Star Wars, but they're all, they have these two giant fans that like hold them up. It's very good. Are those um, fans beam rotors also? I, or are they I, regular I fans? They have shields on them, so I assume they're regular fans, okay. but I don't know. Uh, we will talk about beam rotors next episode where they start talking a lot about beam rotors. <laughs> yeah. To, to hit the point on boots really quick, I think I'm going, I'm still thinking about boots. Uh, always thinking about boots. boots. <laughs> Um, I, you know, I'll wait until we see the Gundam, really see the Gundam. We'll talk about it when we talk about if we we like the Gundam. Yeah. Uh, so they talk about, uh, the Gundam fighting Asher's fully assembled suit, which is called the Shoku. This is just the Zaku of this show. It seems like, cause the other things are also called Shoku so far. Mm. Um, Asher seems to recognize the Gundam when it forms and appears in the forest. And then the two face off with beam sabers, uh, Uso is sweating, not ready to be piloting a Mo- uh, Gundam yet, and he's like, oh, we're in like a standstill here, but then just kicks the head off the Shoku, yeah. <laughs> uh, which forces Asher to detach and flee the battlefield. Uh, Uso is stressed out, still amazed that he's alive as the Gundam comes back into base. Uh, everyone scrambles to check out the Gundam. Uso stands on uh, like outside the cockpit and cheers because he's alive. And Shakti wonders if he knows what he's doing. She mentions that it's only been two or three days and they're already so far from their home as we reach at the end. And it does basically the flashback. Doodaloo, doodaloo, doodaloo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so one, I think that this fight was pretty cool. I'm, yes. I think there's already like lots of interesting characterization around Chronicle and Uso as like pilots. Um, mm-hmm. Uso is very much just like feels like he's very much in the in the classic trademark. Just is a natural at piloting a giant robot, but isn't necessarily emotionally ready for that responsibility or for the idea of having to hurt people. Um, mm-hmm. But there's a specific thing I like about the Chronicle stuff, which is while while Chronicle while Asher. We couldn't call him Chronicle or we're going to call him Asher. What are we going to do? I call him Asher. Okay. When Asher 
Um, I like both names so much that it's hard not to just good name. do both. Uh, when Asher uh, uh, is going out, he is told, like, hey, make sure to be on the ground when you use the Gatling gun, because otherwise it'll be a waste of your time. Like, you're not going to hit anything. And then he, he is out of ammo by the time he hits the ground because he's used <laughs> the Gatling gun too much. And the thing that I don't know is, is that because he is, like, headstrong and, like, fuck it, I'll use the Gatling gun whenever I want, or is he, like, a, a potential ace pilot who knows how to counteract the effects of the Gatling gun's, like, recoil by flying a certain way? Um, and it would have worked if only it wasn't Uso in the Gundam, you know? Uh, I mean, next episode, like, his lieutenant refers to him as, like, the princess's shitty little brother. So True. I assume it's the first one. True. <laughs> um... My other question here is whether or not we like, whether or not you like the Gundam and whether or not where you're at on transforming or combining parts mobile suits at this point. Boots are good. Boots are good. Yeah, there's a, there's boots a part that's just called boots. I also like the implication here is that they, they fixed the one problem with the combining mobile suit and just built a lot of every part. That's so, one yes. thing I like a lot for sure. Um, I, so I come into this having like I don't like combining mobile suits. I just want to mm -hmm. see the robot, or I like mm -hmm. I like a robot. I, I came around eventually on the on the Zeta Gundam in Double Zeta because of the way in which it was sometimes used for extra mo mobility as it could turn into a jet. Where yes. it was like, oh, we got to get over there really quick. I'm gonna go out there in the Zeta, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. um, this is the first time I've ever liked this sort of combining, like, mobile suit because they specifically – it sells me on the idea of, like, oh, all of the expensive stuff is in the top. Like, it's the, it's the like, the cockpit. It's the head. And, like, boots are cheap. If someone loses some boots, it's okay. We can shoot out a new pair of boots. Um, I don't know if you know this, but you don't need legs in space. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need legs in space. <laughs> also, it's not just you don't need legs in space. I, there's a value to just having a plane that flies around. Yes. Like totally. I don't, I don't, I don't particularly care about the moment of transformation, which these are often sold on. Mm -hmm. But I really like the idea that you don't need to have a whole ass mobile suit like doing recon over a forest. Right, right, totally. I'm with you there. Um, and I was like, really with you with the factory thing. The like idea yeah. of like, oh yeah, we just have a bunch of these spare parts, which all which answers the question I've always had across all previous Gundam of like, hey, that Gundam got fucked up. Where did you get the parts to fix it in space? And here they're like, oh no no no, we just we built a bunch of factories. We have a bunch of storehouses of extra parts. Don't worry about it. I mean, the answer in original Gundam is they didn't. <laughs> right. Well, that's why original Gundam is so good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I like that the. Uh, the cockpit has like a plain cockpit, so it's like actually open and yes. like transparent. Like it's got an actual glass cockpit, um, which is very strange because they brought in the um, uh, the three hundred and sixty degree camera to like put you in the world, like give the battles more context. Uh, but now by actually like making you see the outside world in a more real way, I don't know. I like the fact that there's both the, the camera and the um, transparent cockpit it's just a weird decision uh, that i ended up liking quite a lot yeah especially with how usually when you go into the gundam cockpit you're just in another world until someone either jumps in or pierces your cockpit like it's completely impenetrable and uh not on the battlefield in a certain way um like and playing a lot with uh that sort of distance that being in a mobile suit gets you is, is nice i like what they're doing with uh like the way they're progressing this stuff well, also, so far, the victory is not does not depict it as a special robot compared mm -hmm. to, like, other Gundam. True. Uh, which are always very singular in their universe, by, for whatever reason or another. Like, you get the sense that the, uh, what's they're called? The uh, Shoku are, like, they have a bunch of interesting tricks that the Gundam doesn't have. It's just a robot that fights. Like, they have ridiculous beam rotor helicopter arms and ridiculous weapons and cool bug eyes. And they're the ones that have all the fancy tricks because they're made by a place with infrastructure. Right. Meanwhile, the League Militaire are, like, secretly building a thing that they, like, a kit they downloaded off the internet to get a Gundam going. <laughs> yeah, like, th this isn't Anaheim coming in with, like, hey, look what we we've got now. We've bought you an entire battle platform. <laughs> right, right. I'm super curious to know what is up with the League Militaire, and, like, I mean, again, we'll figure, we'll find out. I'm, I'm, it is... I don't know how the two of you do this, where you only watch two episodes a week. I, there are <laughs> no, questions it's... that I have. We just come in and go, I have no fucking idea. At some oh. point, they'll explain this, hopefully. Maybe. I hope. I hope they do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
but yeah, I'm very interested in the League Militaire and how they're set. Like, I'm very ha- happy that the the they've decided to take an approach of an actual third party in the fight, in the sense of like the AU was kind of this, but uh, it was led by Shah, who knew what the deal was, right? Right. Like, and then you saw that happen as he left, and then people did not know what the deal was, and then it just became the Earth Federation. Uh, here you have a much more naive organization that doesn't realize it's essentially. Um, like f- fighting for the Earth Federation by fighting uh, on Earth, um, but they, like this organization's goals are very small scale. They just want to be left alone, and it is definitely playing with the idea that these people don't know uh, or aren't considering the wider context of their actions, and probably going to go very badly for them when they come face to face with the wider context of their actions <laughs> throughout the course of the series, mm-hmm. uh, as they discover the actual power relations here. Uh, as anyone in proximity with the Earth Federation always does. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But, like, these people are the Earthnoids who don't feel like cops, and that hasn't happened before. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah, I can't think of... Like, uh, no one. No, I'm thinking... <laughs> no. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, there's, there's some more stuff with that next episode that we'll probably talk about. Yep. Um, yeah. So I assume we're kind of done with episode one. As we have three more episodes of anime to talk about. <laughs> yes, we do. Victory Gundam, episode two, is called The Day I Met the Machine. Not to be confused with the prior week, which was the day after he met the machine. Interestingly, mine says the day he met the machine. Um, hmm. I think my subtitles say the day he met the machine. My Plex okay. server says the day I met the machine. So, okay. yes. Uh, we'll go with the subtitles. The day he met the machine. Yes. Uh, so, uh, we found out that... Uh, Casarelia is the city where uh, Shakti and Uso are from. Uh, Shakti is narrating and mentions that Uso, they're waiting for Uso's father and mother to return. Um, and then we get a full flashback of Uso parachuting over a farm because this is just the kind of kid he is. Uh, young Jim we, we Kirk don't... in stealing a car <laughs> <Yeah>. in Iowa. <laughs> yeah, is he just doing this for fun? Do we know why? He's... No, they do not mention why. Okay. Great. Oh, but Shakti is watching concerned in the way that, like, your friend who regularly does skateboard tricks they should not be doing, you would watch <laughs> them do them. I I like the the first episode begins with just a completely out of context action scene of him being in a robot for no reason, uh, and then they flash back to what was clearly the actual opening, and it's just as completely out of context to <laughs> <laughs> whatever he's doing. <laughs> like, uh, oh, okay, it's still Gundam. Uh. As he's parachuting, a core fighter buzzes past them, chased by a helicopter, uh, which disrupts Uso's parachute. He almost falls. Um, we find out that the best buzz have like a team called the Yellow Jackets, continuing their theming. Very good. <laughs> um, and then we find that the uh, mobile suit has... This is the first time we really see the propeller arm. This is Asher's suit from episode one. Uh, it's got his cool bug eyes. They are chasing after Marbit, who is in the core fighter. Uh... Let's see. Asher gets in the way in his in his mobile suit in front of the helicopter because he's like, "Don't shoot it down. I want to capture this core fighter. Figure out what they're doing building these machines." Uh, we cut to the mechanics all arguing about who's going to go out and save uh, Marbit, and they decide they can't afford to lose any mechanics, so no one's going to go. Uh, Marbit gets shot in the leg. Uh, Uso gets his parachute caught on Asher's mobile suit, uh, which throws off his aim right as he's about to hit Marbit. Uh, Uso gets caught on the suit and hanging on for dear life as his uh, parachute gets shredded. Uh, the old men, uh, the mechanics all watch as he struggles on top of the suit. He climbs up on the chest and gets spotted by the camera. Asher is very surprised and starts crashing into trees uh, as it's still chasing off the core fighter and he's now watching this kid climb on his Gundam. Uh, Uso kicks open the control release and falls at the hatch and just immediately starts yelling at Asher. Um... <laughs> And we get here maybe the most amazing scene in the world. Uh, Asher's <laughs> like, how dare you yell at one of Bespa's yellow jackets? Uh, and then Uso's like, how dare you be on this earth? You don't belong here. <laughs> yep. uh, the mobile suit is skimming across the surface of the lake as the two just start fucking beating the shit out of each other. <laughs> and Uso's like, space stories are in space. And then Asher's like, you have no business being here polluting earth. And it's just Shar and Amro, but this is episode two. Episode and these two. are two children yep. who just have this ideology baked into them now. Now, and it's not a thing they had to come through through 15 years of sitting through <laughs> war. Uh, I like that this just feels like the two shows uh, that ZZ Gundam is put into one moment and in, in like a blender. Because <laughs> it's like, what if the end of the show, but also still the Gundam was getting kicked in the balls? Like, yes. <laughs> it's 
all of God. that in one moment. Tomino is here, fully formed. It really, yeah. I, here's what I will say: is two episodes in, I am already way more on board than I was on Double Zeta, the, the opening bits of Double Zeta. So, yes. that's <laughs> a great uh, achievement for sure. I mean, I think these are the best opening episodes that Gundam has had since the first show. But that mostly speaks to the openings of Gundams aren't really at this point that great. No, because uh, you have the like kind of washy bullshit in them zz and then you got uh, the... i would say the first the f- best first two episodes are still stardust memory and then the rest of stardust memory <laughs> happens so yeah stardust memory opens really well at least uh, uh congratulations <laughs> on getting through stardust memory by the way uh, no, you, you know it ends really strongly as long it as does. you ignore the actual romance that's uh-huh. at the key of the show <laughs> god uh god anyway uh the mobile suit crashes into a lake uh they are both like just uh, floating out into the water. Uh, Uso manages to climb back into the cockpit while Asher is thrown clear. He writes the mobile suit and takes it out of the water. Uh, can I uh, shout out get... this the frog? There's a frog. I've written down yes. there is a frog. Uh, there's like <laughs> some moment while they're crashing into that lake, uh, there's just like a half beat and a frog hops off of a lily pad into the lake. Yes. And I'm just, it's so, so a thing I should just say really quick is I watched the first episode of Victory, then I watched. Uh, what we're going to talk about next, Macross. I watched the first episode of, of, of Macross on Amazon's bad streaming service. And yes, um, I have two notes here worth, worth talking about in the notion of this frog that I think is really well animated. One, yes. uh, early on in my episode one notes I have, it's so weird to go back from a non-OVA Gundam. This looks fine, I guess. And then coming back from the bad Amazon rip of Macross, I've written down here, um, where where is it here? Uh, pause, I came back to this after watching Macross and a bunch of other shit this week, and it's so bright and colorful and good. <laughs> yes. So, yes. Um, I actually think um, it looks great. Yeah, it's, it's, I feel like it's really, like, simply animated. Like, yes. the detailing of the OVA Gundams is all lost. Like, they just immediately take that away. But because of that, there's something very, like, expressive about how like rough everything feels mm-hmm. and they do a lot with a little like there are moments when like uso's goggles fall off and you get hit yes. like, one of his eyes and he puts the goggles back up on his eyes and, like those little moments do a lot to make their it feel more detailed than it is or even just like asher has a bruise on his face for the rest yes, of this I was episode just, i was just about to okay, mention sorry. that he yes uh because he comes out and literally it, i wrote uh asher climbs on the shore with a black eye and a bruised ego yeah <laughs> and Perfect. then says how humiliating <laughs> and he's not talking about <laughs> about getting punched out he's talking about losing his damn mobile suit <laughs> to a child to a yes. child who wasn't trying to do this to a then, child who was parachuting for then fun. he immediately thinks to himself i can't believe the league military thought up the idea of attacking us with paragliders <laughs> <laughs> i too could not believe that Asha. <laughs> Uh, uh, anyway, the guy in the helicopter, his name I did not get, uh, n- says, uh, as he sees Uso fly off in the bowls, he's like, oh, I'm surprised Asher's leaving the battlefield. This is just like the queen's little brother. Uh, and then he turns on the helicopter rotors, which are beam rotors, which raises a lot of questions. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, how uh, does this work? Well, I, I, I don't know. I, I, how, do they prefer, <laughs> how do they produce lift? I guess that means that they're like, hard light like they're a physical object because you need it to be able to cut through the air to produce lift right so they have to be like dense enough oh they're cool i know that they're cool (laughs) they are cool more than they are a thing that is practical it's very weird to see and i mean this is the era of energy shields though right like f91 already opened up a door to a lot of weird stuff in this universe yeah and the energy shields were cool too so uh, you know I'm here for it. it. It's you know what I'll say is it's a cool way to very clearly say, hey, this takes place 60 years after the Gundam, you know, yep. like this is this is a new era and we figured out some new technology and yeah, we're still using beam rifles, but guess what? We all of our mechs are helicopters now too. <laughs> the thing the thing I like when I first uh, load this up with my partner, uh, she was like, this looks like a Saturday morning cartoon uh, in like the OP, yeah, and yeah. this stuff also feels like it comes out of the like 80s like toyetic version of action shows where you need to make sure your helicopter has detachable beam blades because right. kids are going to eat that shit up and i like that gu- like this gundam might lean into that in a show where the first episode has a pile of charred bodies in a bombed out city <laughs> yeah yeah uh, fair enough you can have your cake and eat it too if you're tomino this one time and then they fired him <laughs> stop it <laughs> yes um 
So, uh, the autopilot's on in the mobile suit. Uh, Uso pulls up a manual and tries to, like, flip through the manual as uh, he wants to get a control of the suit. Asher signals for the guy in the helicopter, fires his flare, but misses, and it just lands in the lake behind the helicopter, and it continues to fly off, which is extremely good. Uh Uso nearly crashes the mobile suit multiple times as he tries to figure out the controls uh, with a combination of rockets and the beam rotor, which is just on the arm. Uh, he gets control of the mobile suit. So the helicopter beam rotor, I'm like, this is this is goofy, but kind of cool. The arm beam rotor on the mobile suit is like someone watched F91 where he does the thing where he spins his hands yep. and the beam savers do that and thought that's how the Gundam flew. Like, that's the only scene they saw with no context. <laughs> And that man's name was Tomino. <laughs> Yuki Tomino. Uh, uh, we cut back to Uso's house. He just has like this really nice little cottage. Like it's clearly like hand built. It's all like plank wood. Um, and but it, it's like it's nice and cozy. Uh, he climbs into like a little attic of room and starts typing on his computer. Uh, I love this contacting. So much. Uh, a woman named Katagina Luce, that's her full name, her full last name, uh, hyphenated, um, in a letter. But before that, it flashes his screen where it's just a bunch of pictures of her. Is this like his like girlfriend pen pal? Does he have a Canadian girlfriend? And is it her? What is happening here? Uh, my only note here is I love to fax my friends. Um, <laughs> I it is I. It's cool seeing people. It's, I love the scene because it gives you a little glimpse of like what his life is just like living in yes. the woods and like yeah he's the internet he has like you also I think like behind him there are some things hanging on the walls that I thought were pictures yeah. of her he's like I think it's a Canadian girlfriend situation or at least a pen pal situation yes where where it's just like this is what his day is he goes out for a, a paraglide for fun maybe he does some like light farming I don't know I don't know if there are parents involved I don't know what his like the more i talk through this the less i know about his life but i do yes. know he emails his friend katagina yes. who wants the corrupt elites to be bombed <laughs> um, i know he lives with his mom who is gone but coming back i think yeah, that's right the, the, yes yeah. shock team mentions that at the beginning of this episode okay uh his mom but, left him some ham damn it it's it's not like right, he just yes. hangs out paragliding because he immediately is like oh the zanskar empire of side two they're <laughs> here right. on earth actually and i want to warn you because they're probably Probably coming for your city um and then she is like writing in her diary in the fanciest villa in all the land and <laughs> is like called away to dinner as the fax fi fires up so she does not get oh. this important fax telling her that her city's about to get bombed it's such I have a, a do you have it okay please read it i have i have a screenshot of the facts please thank uh, this you. is in the subtitles uh, it's not as it's not as ridiculous but there's a couple things it's mostly just well written uh we just have, how are you, Miss Katagina Luz? I did something very terrific today. <laughs> uh, M dash, I operated the real mobile suite. <laughs> <laughs> However, it is difficult for me to explain how it happened in this letter. <laughs> Yeah, I bet. I have trouble explaining it in my thousand word summary. <laughs> this kind of Gina leaves, after this experience, I have got a feeling that the rumor that the troops of the Zaskal Empire on side two might come to Earth to might come to attack the Earth soon could be true. <laughs> now, now I am really worrying about it and writing this to you. Ukso bibbing. <laughs> 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 it definitely calls him Uxo with an X. Yeah, I, I did catch uh, that. I'm like, that's not his name at all. That's a good uh, name too, though. Honestly, what is his real uh, last name? It's Uso. Uh, Uso. Awin. Uh, e W I N. I think. Oh, okay. Not yeah, that's not bibbing. <laughs> not bibbing. It's yeah. off in a whole different way. Uh, still a good letter. I love that he. They like I operated a real mobile suit with real underlined. My Fantastic. <laughs> Mobile Suite. Sorry, Mobile Suite. Apologies. Apologies. <laughs> it's got an L of it. Mobile Suite um, Gundam is uh, my favorite place Mobile to stay Suite on Gundam. vacation. Yes. Uh, he's interrupted. Oh, he sends the fax. He's just sitting there. And then he hears people in his house. And it turns out that it's a young girl and two guys. Uh, they seem like slightly older than him. I wouldn't call them guys. They're also kids. Uh, show up at the house thinking it's abandoned. Uso bursts out of his room, uh, ready to attack. And the guy like turns and he's like, I'll, does he, is he threatening to throw a knife at him? Is that what happens there? Well, he has the knife. Cause he's yeah. cutting the ham and eating like huge yes. hunks of ham. 
And then, it's in the- like, Uso's got his hands jacket like he has a gun. Uso doesn't have a gun. <laughs> Uso, don't pretend you have a gun when people are armed if you don't actually have one. But that's what the other guy says. Like, come on now. <laughs> like, yeah, what's yeah. happening? He does, I think he says, like, um, like, I'll take your head out of your pocket or else I'm going to throw this knife at you or something like that. And, yeah, that's very good. Uh we find out the, uh, the girl's name's Susie. I think I get the guy's name a little later, but I don't have everyone's name here yet. Um, and he's like, uh, if you were, if you were home, why was, why weren't the lights on? He's like, what are you talking about? I, like, I want to make sure I'm not caught. And then this is a bit where our subtitles differ, but Wikipedia backs me up. Uh, yes. The guy calls Uso an illegal earth immigrant, uh, huh. which yes. implies. So what was yours? Mine was an illegal Earth resident. Yes. Oh, those are way different. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so wait, wait is, is, is you, yeah, no, I know. Huh? Uh, Uso's a space noid then, but I don't think that's true. What I think is, I think what I think this is is they were all they all are supposed to be living in the Uig like special zone city, oh. and these people like. Uso's family and Shakti decided that they're not going to live in a city where they have to like work in a factory. They're going to go subsistence farm in the woods, right? right? That's my read on this. Okay, but that's interesting. Uh, but both the both probably the Earth Federation and uh, the Zanskar Empire would just see them as like a disease on the still recovering Earth, right? Mm-hmm. But in radically different contexts, where like Zanskar wants everyone off Earth, but the Earth Federation definitely wants to make sure that everyone is in their like designated apartment buildings and not building houses in the forest. <laughs> right, right, right. I like that read. I, I think that's an interesting read. That makes sense. Um, yeah. I definitely read it as as like, oh, did he and his family come here, come to Earth illegally from space? But I couldn't quite make sense of that given his own reaction to being so defensive about Earth. You yes. know, um, so yeah, that, that's my thing too. I think uh, this is just someone who actually believes human beings should live on Earth, and like, we'll find out, I guess. But the way that his like life is depicted, it's it's a way that seems sustainable. Like the whole point of like Char and Space Noids, like right. Manifest Destiny, is getting into space or whatever, is because the, the humans don't know how to treat the Earth. Uh, right, and I think it's interesting that we're seeing someone who maybe lives a life where they aren't like full of capitalism and pollution right right it's almost like a, a fun mirror or like an inverted mirror of um of judo which is like judo was so interesting because we finally got to see someone whose day-to-day life one they cared about their day-to-day life they wanted to know what was happening after the war they had goals and ambitions that were not just like getting through the war but also we see him at the beginning at as someone whose life is very directly impacted by the war, it's built around, you know, uh, uh, scrapping old war machines. His family has have been forced, his parents have been forced to go to a different uh, colony so that they can raise money to put him and his sister through school. Like, all of that mm-hmm. stuff is happening. And here, we, I, I just like contextualizing it in more than just like, oh, yes, this is the status quo boy who it has like the middle class uh, upbringing of the the theoretical viewer. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. so like, yeah, he, his life is already one that is not just the status quo, or that is not just the viewer's own status quo. You know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, we find out that these kids were chased out of Largrain. Uh, they have this tense moment, and then they have a like a stand down. The guy's like, "Look, I don't want to start a fight here. Like, we're just all living." <laughs> our lives. Uh, but then there's the sound of approaching beam rotors and everyone uh, files outside. We find out that the guy in charge with like the dark hair is named Rolo. Um, and they spot a small fleet of helicopters buzzing over the forest, uh, headed for Uig where they all are like, Oh, they're going to bomb that place off face the earth, which they, you know, we know they do. Uh, Marbit sees this happening and it says they need to go and help. Uh, Asher, still in the forest, no one's picked him up, uh, has this moment where he's like, I can't believe they've just started scattering Minovsky particles, uh, which I don't know implies if, like, oh, I should have radioed in and didn't think about it, right. maybe? I don't know what that is, all, like, what his objection to this is, uh, but he's very mad, regardless. <laughs> mad all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um... Rolo uh, says that the camion, uh, which uh, League Military Ship, is headed to Uig uh, to go and take on the Zanskar Empire. Uh, he mentions that Largain had a guillotine, and a 
person named Kadagi, uh, Kagati, which we haven't met, uh, whose best was leader, is using this guillotine to keep the peace uh, by killing people, I guess. Uh, Jackson immediately had the question, is this a real or metaphorical guillotine? And I was like, well, the only it, it's probably real, but it better be a beam guillotine or I'm going to feel very <laughs> cheated. <laughs> At this point, yeah. yes. Um, yeah. They also yeah. do the thing where they're like, it's Ka- Kagati, and they're like, uh, Gatti's guillotine, and yeah, I, like is that is like is that like a well known phrase in this world? Like, what is what is? I'm trying to figure it out. The Gatti. I mean, I guillotines. guess I guess if I guess if someone's going like publicly going around guillotining people, and their name could be turned into like uh, alliteration, you would do that, right? Yeah, fair, fair. Yeah. My assumption is just whatever the super weapon that um, I I think it's a literal happen. guillotine. You think it's a literal guillotine? I yes, I think they are. I think they are just going around because it's way easier to scare villagers, like p- cities, into leaving Earth by just guillotining a tenth of the populace than trying to murder the entire populace, right? If best were going around literally guillotining Earth Federation leaders, <laughs> oh, then... they're not guillotining Earth Federation <laughs> leaders. Let's be real here. Uh, that's true. That's the thing, right? That is the actual. So, like, this is where I start to go, like, hmm, is this going to end up being like a, a weird French Revolution or like the the dangers of revolution parable, right? They're like, oh, of course, the the empire comes from a good place, but you know, they're they're driven by by excess and are are and paranoia and you know that that style of story that we've seen a million times. Um, that that I think undersells the complexity of that historical moment um mm-hmm. we will see uh, as we continue and and most importantly i'm so curious to see what uso and the kind of leads end up making of of what they find out yes mm-hmm. uh so they are all sitting on the hill watching as Uwe gets bombed uh over the mountain this is on an the incredible scene yeah it's yeah. really good um Uso worries about Katagina and then decides to go off on the speeder. We are told that the speeder is called a WAPA, which is just a good name, uh, <laughs> honestly. Um, Uso is with Haro as he gets to the... So, is this the mobile suit he stole from yes, Asher? Right? Yes. It wasn't, yes. It wasn't the same color, was it? Or did I just yeah. totally mistake the it's... fact that he's... Okay. It's orange, it's, right? It's the same color. It's orange. It's, yeah. okay. He's in the... He later, in episode one, gets the red one when he will then destroy this exact mobile suit. Okay. Um, mm, mm-hmm. Flashback. Okay. This is this show. is where my mistake was. <laughs> yes. I write a lot of notes as the episode's going. Fair. It's yeah, not no, like I write these after the facts. So uh, Haro tries to stop Uso from getting aboard by like clinging on to his like rope that he like his winch that he's pulling himself on. <sighs> Uh, and it's very cute. This is the first time Haro has done anything proactive in the history of Gundam, basically. Um, is this the same Haro? Uh, this is my question. <laughs> it's, not, it's not the same Haro. One day they'll let us know. One day before Kimino <laughs> fully retires, give me the Haro story, please. I just want I just want the like kind of tongue in cheek slice of life about this like Haro that lived through like six generations of Gundam. God. <laughs> The Haro droid have its memories wiped. Has, you know, Haro, has Haro ever met R two D two? Has this ever happened in in uh, Japanese would, fiction? It almost had to have happened, right? It had to. Uh, have. Have happened. Unfortunately, if they're going to do it now, it's just going to be BB eight, which I like a lot less. Oh, I thought way, way, way less. I don't want two round ones like that. Yes, you know. Mm-hmm. Also, R two D two just is a different attitude. I want R two D two to meet Haro, not yes, not BB eight. Um, as he takes off in the mobile suit, uh, this is one of those like really good animation flourishes where there's just this great shot of the water fountain, like sloshing water over the side yeah. over the force of like the suit taking off nearby. Um, we find out the dog's name is Flanders. That's very important. Uh, <laughs> uh the, the best of the soldier that's been hanging around forever, uh, sees the mobile suit take off and he's like, oh, I'm going to go see what, what that is. Uh, can't contact it because the radio, because of the Minoski particles now being there, um, realizes that it's probably not Asher, uh, just because of the way it's piloting. He attacks it. Uh, Uso attacks back, uh, he the the rotors could also be used as like an energy shield which is all very cool uh the boy knows how to fight a little bit because he sets his like rifled auto fire and like sets it in like a brush to distract uh the enemy as he then like faints around yeah uh, and cuts down his suit with the beam saber also in this generation the beam sabers are the like really tiny star wars 77 I, yes beam sabers they're, they're amazing <laughs> Um, 
he destroys the enemy suit. It falls to the forest floor. Uh, Uso is really surprised that he won and then is like concerned that he's just murdered someone, uh, presumably for the first time. Uh, Shakti, who has read the script and knows what happens in Gundam, uh, clutches her face uh, as she watches Uso take back off for the city. And then we cut to present day Shakti narrating Uso changed that day. Uh, and it's her in the present carrying the baby uh, as we reach the end. Yeah. It's here. It's a new Gundam show. It is. These are really strong episodes. Yeah, I like These them really a lot. are. Uh, I am very excited for wherever the hell this is going. Um, I like I like Uso a lot. Uh, I like that his natural reaction is to be mad at space noids, and the show is very, very good at portraying this as like a not wrong but um, incomplete view on Uso's part. Right, like he lives here, and he has, and then now there are enemies coming to kick him out of here therefore he hates them very simple basic thing uh but you know the earth federation are not going to pay attention to the league military we all know this <laughs> um yep. and when these two things like at some point he's going to realize that and i'm just waiting for that that day hopefully it'll come like 15 episodes <laughs> of the series and not 50 um because i like i say like they're already having the amaro shah argument in episode two uh so I'd, I'd like them to just keep going from here <laughs> But yeah, also, like that argument, that argument's more interesting when it's not Amro and Char having it, right? Because they come with such distinct context because of who right. they are that, mm -hmm. like, that mean that the argument doesn't get to mean ideologically what it needs to mean because it's also these two men who have been rivals for fifteen years, right? And also yeah, no. who have who have their whose relationships to the rest of the power structures like predispose them to certain positions um mm -hmm. uh, it's super interesting to me that the character who's being positioned so far as like the, the clear rival in chronicle asher um is like the the little brother of the queen right like not the mm -hmm. little brother of the queen who was killed 20 years ago like this is someone who has we've been having the conversation in the discord around whether or not char has ever uh, betrayed anyone um and what I will say is Chronicle Asher seems like if he decides he wants things to change inside of the Zanskar Empire, he has a little bit more push and pull than Shar did as uh, as if he had ever used his real name, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So I think there's going to be an interesting difference here. Um, the action is just good. Like, you know, I... Yes. I, I I know that it's easy to be like the battle rages, uh, but yes. I think in the second episode specifically, there are so many little moments of kind of combat choreography that yes. do that tell a story the way that like a good uh, the way that a good fight scene is supposed to tell a story. And a lot of Gundam has not been that over the years. You yeah. know, that's not like no. there were not when, good fights. When but... the battle rages, I write the battle rages. When he uses his gun as a feint and then dives from above, totally. I'm going to write that because that's amazing. <laughs> um, and I think I, what I'm curious about to some degree is like for all of the the problems of 0083 and for the fact that like 0080 doesn't really focus that much on um, big combat encounters, the ones that are there are really well done um, and are well choreographed also. And it feels like everyone's kind of had to step up their game in as also mecha anime has existed now for years and years. And it feels like there are people who really know how to tell fun fight scenes uh, right mm -hmm. out of the gate, especially remembering that like the what episode this was supposed to be originally is not like, you know what I mean? Like it's it, this could have not come out of the gate this strong and it has. And that's really nice. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, I really like the um, classic bit where uh, child steals mobile suit, can't control it, and then the rival is like, "Ah, oh, they're mocking me." <laughs> 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 Always good. Extremely. But yeah, no, I'm very excited. I I know no one liked the show, including Tomino. Um, so I'm very interested to see where it ends up going. But I think it's off to a good start, at least. Yeah. Yeah, I'm so, so curious. My only other note here is, um, I know that Jackson, you don't watch the next times on. M, do you watch? No, I don't. You do. I I, I watch the, next times on every show I watch. I am not going to say what the next time on is, but what I will say is, there's a very good orchestral version of the main theme that plays during it. Yes. Um, and so good. Jackson, you should at least find a way to listen to that at some I'll, point. I will. Is it is it as good as the um, animation I won? Hmm. No, it's like it's, softer. Yeah, okay. it's. I didn't even recognize it at first, and then and then I did. Oh, I I specifically always am waiting for the orchestrated version of the main theme because that's usually what Gundam does. So right, I was right. very excited to hear it. Um, mm -hmm. 
But yeah, uh, it's good. It's good. Not quite as uh, enthralling as the next ons of the show we're about to talk about, which oh are my God. intense. <laughs> <laughs> they are so much. Uh, so I guess that's a good sign to do it. That we started the Gundam show, we're interested, uh, now we have to watch it for 25 more weeks. Because <laughs> <laughs> this is the life we chose. Oh, boy. Uh, boy, yeah, I know. Uh, but with that, it's time to talk about Macross. クロノソラを貫いて地球を訴えた土は我らを幼い人類に目覚めてくれと放たれたマクロス Our backup show for Victory Gundam is Super Dimension Fortress Macross. Uh, that is uh, a show from 1982, I do believe. Yes, uh, it's a show from 1982, uh, directed by uh, Noburo Ishiguro. Uh, and it is a, a comedy response to Gundam, is what it's like pitched as, but also it's just a uh, serious and beloved mecha show in its own right. Uh, yeah, it, so it was it was originally supposed to be that, and yes. even in the conceptual stages, moved away from that. Gotcha. So. Yes. So there's like remnants of that there, but also it's just its own mech show with its own ideas, um, and it's also like the the basis of Robotech in America. I don't know shit about Robotech, but I know yeah, that Macross was like uh, so where that started. <laughs> yes. Matt, if you have the context, Robotech is not the first mech show I watched. The first mech show I ever watched was Gigantor. Um, which is <laughs> is a different thing. It's a super Gigantor was a super robot show from like yes. I want to say the '60s, uh, black and white, like very much of that early early era of, of anime. Um, it's by the same person who did Giant Robo. Um, uh, and and then I watched, but that was like when I was like a baby, like a true like four, you know. But then when I was like seven or six or eight or somewhere in the the really like i'm a i'm a i'm of the age to where i could be a background character in a mech show um Mm -hmm. i sci-fi channel started airing robotech in the mornings it was like robotech and ronin warriors um and so i watched all of robotech uh, all three, like through the Robotech is a nightmare. Robotech. Mm. So do you, you, you <laughs> do you know the gist of why Robotech is so weird? So is it, is it toys? Just, I, Jackson I probably doesn't actually know the answer. To this. I legitimately don't know. Okay. Neither Robotech nor Macross really came to the UK. Okay, so Robotech is three seasons um, or three sh- three shows, I guess. Uh, and the first one is is using Macross. The second one uses uh, uh, Super Dimension Cavalry Southern Cross, and the third one uses Genesis Climber Mosa- Mosapita. Uh, okay. These are different anime, <laughs> and they were like, "That's one. We're gonna make that one anime." Uh, I believe the first season of Robotech is basically just Macross, um, but eventually, it like they try to recreate a new coherent fictional world from multiple shows that do not that do not actually do that um there are like similarities in designs between some of these shows but they are not meant to be in the same universe and robotech was like no fuck it harmony gold who is the production company was like do it put it together like that this also ends up intersecting in a weird way with battletech the the at the time tabletop mech war game because battletech originally had some robotech and therefore macross designs in it um and those have since been like ethered out of existence it's like they just don't exist anymore it's very strange it's a very you should, people should look into it harmony gold fucking sucks um and it's really frustrating because as someone who does has a limited amount of time i still watch a lot of anime with dubs and it's so frustrating that the only dub for the macross material is the robotech dub because it's not the same thing i believe um but this is the first time i'm going back and watching all of macross actually watching it as macross i've watched other macross series but this will be the first time that i go through all of super dimension dimension fortress super dimension fortress macross yeah i also have trouble with this (laughs) i want to say dimensional yeah right yeah yeah every time um 
Okay, that's that's wild. <laughs> yeah, look into it. It is it is truly wild. Um, uh, but, um, but but like it's so it's one of those things where the first season of Robotech. If you look at the names of the episodes, it's the same names as the episodes, and so you could convince yourself these must be the same thing. Um, but like character names are wildly different, and uh, I believe some events end up going differently. And so I'm, I guess if you're listening to this and you can assure me that I could watch Robotech in the background while doing other stuff, <laughs> tell me that. But I'm going to try my best to just watch Super Dimension Fortress Macross while I listen along. Mm-hmm. First episode of Macross is called Booby Trap. Uh, uh, and you wrote full summaries for both of these because why? Yeah, I'm going to try. I'm going to try to cut these down a little bit just because this episode has gone very long. Normally, these are an hour long. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, an island in the year 1999. We see as an alien ship crashes through Earth, uh, destroying whole cities, and just decimates this island. Uh, we are told it was a giant battleship, 1,200 meters in length. No alien beings were found aboard the ship, but it was proof that alien technology existed. Uh, so the United Earth Nations government made an effort to restore the spaceship, to take humanity to the stars, uh, but it, in doing so, in trying to take control of this plan, it caused wars across the globe. Uh, in a single sentence, we are told the unification wars existed and then came to an end, and this ship became the Macross, uh, ready to go in the year 2009, where we start our anime. I love that there are the unification wars. Um, it would be so easy for them to have told the story and been like, and then everyone realized we needed to come together to fix this alien ship. And like, no, everyone would fight over this. Are you kidding me? And everyone instantly fought over it. <laughs> um, I'm curious if those will ever get more detail, you know? Yeah, I don't know. There's so many Macross shows. Right, so. right. Who knows? Uh, also, they the very first thing they do is just, what if the colony drop was bigger? Um, <laughs> as they just do the opening of Devil 79. Uh, bigger and less explainable, right? Like I, I think this is such a strong premise for a show <laughs> of like an alien ship lands, or for any sort of sci-fi story, an alien ship lands and a city grows up around it and people try to make sense of it is a great premise and there are a million stories you can tell that take place before the action actually starts even yep. yeah no, the opening crawl alone is like there's so much space there yeah um so we see the city it is like a modern 80s city and yet it has a battleship that like defies understanding in the size of it just sitting in the skyline and the mayor is lamenting that when it takes off it's going to change your skyline and harm local businesses because <laughs> this is the kind of show we are watching now <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, we get some character names. Uh, the captain of the ship is named Captain Global. Good name. Mm -hmm. That's good a fucking good mm -hmm. name. Uh, Lieutenant Hayase is on the bridge. Uh, she is prepping the ship as they talk about the captain not being here yet. Uh, the lady piloting it is like, oh, he was probably out partying all night. Uh, Tomino's gone. We have characters who drink and have like human lives. It's amazing. <laughs> No one's yeah, no. had a single bit of alcohol in all of uh, Tomino Gundam, except for <laughs> Char having one whiskey, but poignantly, and drops the glass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, the instant it's like, oh, right, characters can be more than just, uh, like, walking ideological representations of, like, an argument. Yes. Uh, it's just people chatting about their lives in a way that is like, Gundam doesn't do this. And I appreciate that from Gundam. I appreciate that Tomino just here to give you a lecture on some level. Uh, but I'm glad that we have this to balance it. There's even like euphemisms for have, having having had sex, which is not a yes. thing I would have ever thought of in Gundam. That never would happen. No one's ever had sex in Gundam ever. So no, no, not yet. Anyway, there will be a time <laughs> o you'll get there. Only only in an interview given after the fact can you talk about <laughs> sex in Gundam. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um. So Lieutenant Hayase talks about a major Fokker who clearly she is into. Uh, a small craft approaches the Macross. In it is our main character, Hikaru Ichijo, who is piloting. Um, we see uh, Major Fokker. He is just one of the Slager Law motherfuckers mm -hmm. that exist in all these shows. Uh, yes. He is providing commentary to like a Blue Angel style stunt show of these Valkyrie planes. And Ichijo flies through them in his dumb little prop jet plane and disrupts it and immediately gets in a shouting match with Fokker, who is like 
his teacher because he just calls him senpai. So he's the person who taught him to fly, I guess. But Ichijo is not a soldier, whereas Fokker is absolutely that. You know, these subs are old that we're all watching because it says senpai with an M. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, Ichijo managed to outpace the jets in his propeller plane and the crowd loves it. They just eat it up. Uh, he lands and then Fokker yells at him for showing up at the soldiers because he's trying to demonstrate that their jets are very cool. Uh, and he's like, I don't care if you've won the pilot, like amateur piloting competition three times. He's like, what about the other four times? Seven times, whatever. Uh, Fokker shot down 180 planes in the Unification Wars. And Ichijo's like, well, that just makes you a murderer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, and then incredible. they they, argue, they continue to argue as they approach the petite cola machine, which they get a drink from. And then the petite cola machine gets up and walks over to the next person who might want a drink, uh, <sighs> who is just a like fa looking lady with a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll meet her next episode. Her name's Min May. She's great. Um, instantly likable characters in this anime. I like they're just goofy. It, like there's a lightheartedness to this that is not like it's not like disregarding the things that are in mech anime but feels like it's a thing worth like kind of enjoying for it's like just stop being so self-serious yeah. with your gundam we're gonna have fun here um i know this is this it came out in 82 or whatever but like it has such a strong 70s sci-fi yes vibe yes. to me like all the way through yep it's wild that like this and bottoms are basically airing at the same time wow <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, because this this feels like it's like uh, we like Gundam and we liked uh, Space Battleship Yamato. Yeah. We need those to be the same thing, please. Yeah, <laughs> they sure do. Yep. And then I assume like this show is why like the Zeta is the way it is, like why it is a jet and a mech because this show is popular. That makes sense to my me. Assumption, yeah. So. yeah. Uh, in space, there is a new battleship heading across the skies. Uh, it pulls back, and it's actually many battleships, an entire fleet that is headed for Earth. Uh, this guy t in this ship talks about how they traced, uh, the Macross's hyperspace folding back to this backwater planet. He's like a green Dracula with a Kano mask. There's a lot happening with this design, but it's all bad. Mm -hmm. It's like, <laughs> you're animating this. Why does this look like a cheap sci-fi show suddenly? <laughs> um, I wish, uh, yeah, I don't know. I just, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, this guy's a lot. Uh, Fokker shows Ichijo one of the new Valkyrie jets. Um, a guy gives a speech, uh, like about the glorious launch of the Macross as Captain Global gets, uh, like Lieutenant whispering in his ear about the strange readings. Um, just like 10 years ago when the Macross arrived. Uh, and then the like, uh, official turns to introduce Captain Global just as Global's getting on the elevator to leave the stage. <laughs> uh, on the bridge, as they're like prepping to launch, the original systems of the alien ship start to power up on their own as it suddenly switches into firing mode, uh, which is good. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. They try to switch off all the systems, no avail. The ship then radiates a strange energy between the two big front spines and the main cannon fires, which is a huge energy blast that shoots out over the ocean and out into space where it vaporizes most of the incoming alien ships instantly. Uh the guys in space are like, well, I guess we found the ship we were looking for and <laughs> <laughs> start to head for Earth. Uh, they make it sound like they were chasing whatever the Macross was, uh, like two sides of a war that we're going to find out about. But who can say? None of that is elucidated to us today. Yep. Um, Fokker goes to check out what's going on. Ichijo is left in the jet. Uh let's see. Uh the crew learns that the the that more ships are coming in space and they've already fired the big cannon that they didn't even really mean to fire. And global starts laughing maniacally. And he's like, Oh, we, f we fell for it. We're a booby trap. The alien set up, uh, as he realizes that this was like an automated defense system that they are not in control of, despite all of their efforts to build this giant spaceship. Um, there's a lady named Shammy who then scolds him for smoking a pipe on the bridge as he like starts to puff on his pipe after his speech. And he's like, I, I'm, it's not lit. It's just to keep in my mouth. It's only for show. Um, out in space, these new ships class with Earth, Earth forces. Um, they're surprised at just how prepared Earth is for combat because no one thought Earth would, had like this technology. Um, and then his like the Dracula guy's weird little like goblin lieutenant comes up and he's like, oh, they must have got the information off that <laughs> ship that like, crash landed. Um, 
Global talks about how they were likely, like, he, our orders were not to engage in combat, even though we were going to find enemies in space. We were supposed to not be the uh, instigators. How ironic that we were going to be attacked even before we launched. And I'm like, eh, I mean, look, we all know what yeah. show we're watching here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Fucker. Well, we also get, is, this, is this also, oh, no, I guess, I guess you already got, no, you're good. You're good. I thought a different thing had, had happened, but that has already happened. We're good. Okay. Uh, Fokker hops in, uh, one of the, like, nicer Valkyries with his crew to take off and fight. Uh, the bad guys spot the Macross and say they found the supervision ship, which I assume supervision means the faction. Uh, they talk about how it looks different and seems restored with all this weird primitive technology. Um, and then they mention that it has reaction weaponry that responds to any threat, which is why half their fleet got vaporized. Uh, so they decide to send down fighters to Earth to destroy it, like, with smaller guns so they don't uh, trip the giant cannon. Uh, Ichijo wakes up uh, because he fell asleep in the plane, uh, just waiting for Fokker to tell him what to do. And he's receiving orders to launch uh, because they think he's a real soldier. Uh, he decides to fire up the plane and goes out. Um and then immediately starts screaming as he's in battle, and there are <laughs> thousands of explosions around him. He's having a bad uh, time. Yes. Uh, Ichijo contacts Fokker over the comms, and uh, Fokker comes to look after him, surprised. He's like, you're a pilot. All you got to do is pilot the ship. And he's like, that's not the same thing. How can you be so calm? We're fighting space aliens. Uh, Ichigo's ship takes a hit, and then he pulls his plane up. And then there's this amazing flashback to when him and Fokker were like in love flying prop planes <laughs> in the 30s. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. It's so good. Oh, it's incredible. Um, in a tailspin, he says that he swore he died doing stunts just like his dad, uh, and he is headed right for the Macross. Uh, someone over comms tells him to switch to configuration B, and he does that, throwing a switch as the jet turns into a mech that crashes into the city as it, like, falls through buildings, and the mech stands up, and the mech is a chappy. It's, the end. The, 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 the mech, mech is, is a, chappy. a chappy. Yeah, it is. That is chappy. That makes me like the mechs a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> uh chappy it's good chappy's good hey wait chappy's three good. people on the podcast i think that that's quorum we get to decide yes. now <laughs> chappy is good the council has formed and decided chappy is good <laughs> it's what we wasted our power on we declared Fuck. chappy good <laughs> oh well oh well well spent honestly yeah uh, I guess we're just going to the episode two because you thought that episode was wild. Yeah. <laughs> Thank yes. you so much for taking these notes. So much happens. So much happens. Yes. So much happens. Oh, I do want to mention the uh, the ending of Macross is like a picture book, like like traditional Disney, like old movies of the characters is like being flipped through by an actual <sighs> right. ass hand. It's very good. Uh, yeah, the aesthetic of the show are incredible and around the board. Yep. Uh. So next episode is called Countdown. There are 24 unidentified objects and radar is useless because the weaponry is causing a strange radiation. A Minovsky particle, if you will. <laughs> oh, interesting. interesting. Yeah. Uh, they can't get a hold of Fokker because the radios are also down because uh, of this radiation. The targets are all splashing down to the ocean. Uh, the people in the city are all stunned by the Valkyrie and mech form. And the child and the Fa lady, uh, Min Mei and the child Yot, uh, are all there, are both there, uh, and this kid is super hyped to be standing next to a robot, <laughs> and me too, Fair kid. enough, fair enough. Yep. Uh, patrol helicopters survey the scene, but are shot down by the aliens, um, the, the guy from Speed Racer shows up once again in one of these <laughs> to look at the Macross and ask Global, oh, when are you launching? And Global's like, the ship's not ready yet. And he's like, well, we didn't pour the entire economy of Earth into the ship for you to sit around and tell me it's not ready yet when aliens are landing. Uh, so you need to get it done. Um, then uh, Kim and Shammy are talking the back of, uh, and Shammy's like, are we actually going to space? And she's like, uh, Kim's like, we're on a spaceship. Where, where did you think we were going? She's like, I didn't think we we're actually going into space. But they uh, were going to launch today, no matter what, weren't they? they were yes. Gonna launch. Kim, come on. Uh, Global tries to get across the trouble of taking off, uh, taking on a whole space fleet with one ship that they clearly don't understand, but then he is goaded into launching. Um, the guy leaves the bridge going, leave the negotiation to us politicians. You just fight the wars. 
puffs uh, on the cigar, puffs yeah, out and then Global's chest. like, oh, we're just clearly meant to buy time while they talk, like, make sure that Earth doesn't get destroyed. We're all sacrifices. And, yep, you're right. <laughs> Global's right. <laughs> Uh, so a uh, yacht and Min may go up to like the third floor of their like apartment, uh, where her family lives to uh, look at the robot up close. Uh, and they watch as the head folds down and a chair raises up, but it's an empty chair, which is just the best gag, <laughs> <laughs> uh, because it's a, it's a dual seating jet. So th there's actually two seats that have to unload. So it pulls up and then, uh, Ichijo steps out, uh, the biggest anticlimax to a robot landing <laughs> in front of your house ever. A tiny uh, boy. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and he's like, uh, hey, you there, uh, what does this look like? And she's like, it looks like the plane turned into a robot. And he's like, yeah, it looks like the plane turned into a damn robot. Yeah. <laughs> uh Minmay is clearly not impressed. She's like, "What are you? What are you doing on? Why are you? Why are you surprised that your plane turned into a robot?" He's like, "I'm not a soldier. I didn't know any of this was going to happen. I was just in a plane." Uh, Yot then says, "Well, you must be a thief then, because you don't know why you're in a robot." <laughs> um, Ichijo is like standing on the shoulder, looking at the like gunfire on the robot as a guy driving a truck uh, honks at him from the road and is like, "Move it! I'm driving here." Which uh, <laughs> bless you, man. <laughs> uh. Uh, he loads back in and carefully tries to get the Valkyrie to move as he stumble. He nearly stumbles into a nearby building and then fires rockets to over to correct and then overcorrects and crashes face first into Min May's building through the wall. Nearly she's killing her. <laughs> yes, like... nearly killing her, but she's fine. God. Uh, Matt Cross preps for launch. Uh, the UN forces high command uh, announced that all of the ships are in space are ready to rendezvous with them as soon as they can get out into space. Uh, everyone's at all hands as they commence liftoff. Uh, giant rotors spin. Matt Cross lifts off its moorings and into the sky. Uh, and then on the bow, uh, panels start to bulge as the gravity engines all rip clear of their moorings and up through the hole of the Macross and up into the sky as the Macross crashes back down without gravity controls. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Whoops. <laughs> uh, global collapses in his chair. Uh, incredulous that this has happened. <laughs> um, we see two tow trucks winching, winching the Valkyrie out of the building as they're trying to pull it upright. Uh, and they do, but then it, they pull too far and it falls backwards into another building as Ichijo's like, I can't believe this is happening to me. <laughs> uh, Fokker and his men are heading back to the Macross. Uh, he asks about the Valkyrie and is told that it landed in the city. Uh, he's he's designated as Skull Leader and has like a cool skull on his jet. Uh Clearly in a much different show, a much cooler action man <laughs> show than this one. Uh, he orders his men back to base, then goes and finds the Valkyrie. Um, he lands the ship in the, uh, what's it called? Gear, Gearwalk? Is that what it's called? That's like the... There, this is an acronym. Yes. Uh, I Yeah. So the jets have a medium mode where it's a jet, but with legs I, and like kind of yep. like T-Rex arms. And it's called the Gerwalk mode ground effective reinforcement of winged armament with locomotive knee joint. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I hate it. I'm the, this is the thing. <laughs> I don't like it is the problem is I hate it. That is it. And that's why I haven't ever gone back and watched this is I just, I think it looks so goofy. I like the reasoning that will come up in a moment as to why you might have it as like a mode or like, I, mm -hmm. not the reason I, I don't buy it. I don't think the thing that he says would be true, but I like that there is at least a reason in the canon and the fiction for why. You know, that I don't exist. think I wrote down the reason. What does he, what does he give us the reason this episode? Uh, it's easier to pilot in the Gearwalk mode oh. because, because uh, Ichijo yes. is like, he's like, I don't know how to pilot. Oh, they're, Cause they're all used to piloting planes. Right. Yeah. He's like, well, okay. just put it in Gearwalk mode. That's basically the way it's piloted the way a plane is basically piloted. So I like the idea of like, Hey, it's simpler to pilot in that mode, but you still mm -hmm. have arms and you can walk around and look like a weird plane T-Rex. Um, so my thing is birds are cute. And so I think yeah. the Gearwalks are kind of cute. I don't like, despite being fighter. Jets. I don't like a lot of birds. I think this is what it comes down to. I think you've ID'd okay. it for me. I don't hate people who like the show the, the, or who like these designs. I get it. Um, I, I like, I like Chappie. I like the fighter. It's this middle mode yeah. that is hard for me to deal with. See, see the plane, good. the plane's plane the one good. I'm like, I don't care about. Yeah. I don't care about plane. I barely you care about plane. plane. Oh, plane's cool. <laughs> I like these cause these are like actual, these are way more like actual planes than even the victory core. 
Oh yeah, no, these are just fighter. They're jets. fighter these, jets. This, yeah. this yeah. is yeah. this is this is the show that's like oh military otaku also buy models. Right. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, they're going after the markets. <laughs> God. Um, Anyway, uh, Fokker turns his uh, jet into a mech, which is very cool. It just has the skull on it, so I just was like, oh, crossbone gun. Okay. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> uh, Ichijo asks how these planes turn into robots, and he's like, well, it's classified. If you want to know, you got to join the military. I'm like, nah, I, I don't care that much. Uh, <laughs> so Fokker begins repairing the mech and then explains to him how to stand the robot up. Uh, as they're having this conversation, they're using the like speakers on the mech, so they're just talking in big booming speaker <laughs> voices as everyone can hear them. And everyone's standing around and is getting bored as Minmay and Yacht are getting called away, and everyone just kind of walks away to go get into their shelters because the aliens have landed and they're much more dangerous than these two robots. <laughs> um uh we see the alien robots come out of the ocean, but it's basically like they come out of the Toei logo. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's very cool. There's like these, I wrote down their cool little Walker balls. Cause I didn't realize the size of them, which will come up in a mm -hmm. moment. <laughs> um, cool, big Walker balls, uh, on the alien ship. Uh, they call them regold platoons. Uh, and then the guy orders them all to attack. Fokker teaches them how to turn on, uh, Gerwalk mode. Uh, let's see, everyone gets in the shelters, but Minmay is like, oh, I have to go back to town to get something. And everyone just lets her, which seems dangerous. Uh, the alien ships begin their barrage as from space, they fire down on Macross, but seemingly only attack the, the city around it because they don't want to trigger the like big beams. So they just destroy the city as buildings start to collapse and explode. And it's just devastation. And Fokker and Ichijo just kind of look on this, like, oh, man, they really fucked up the city, huh? Like, they do not care. Um, which is interesting, given that the show remembers that war is hell in, like, five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, they decide to go look for Minmei, uh, because, like, oh, that girl, maybe she got caught in this. We need to go rescue her. Uh, Global gets a report of the Walker assault. They're bombarded with missiles from the, like, alien craft that have now surrounded the ship. Um, because I guess the, the beam cannon can't fire at those, so it's not going to. Uh, the Valkyrie are ordered to attack and come down, and then some of them transform into robots that are, like, the mechs that are just standing, firing, hiding behind buildings, doing the Gundam thing, but the the gay, the Germok Valkyries are, like, half flying through the city. Like, I, the part where they start moving really fast and they're still kind of mechs is the thing that I think really sells the coolness of this thing. Yeah, like, I wish you get, you get a sold you get a soldier standing there as like the plane chicken flies past them. <laughs> yeah, I I you know what it is is like when I think about that mode, I or like that sort of speed I do like a lot. I think the there's like a there's a, a shot where like the missiles are chasing it around a building mm -hmm. and like the missiles in this look great. Obviously, people probably are familiar with the the kind of um Itano Circus, which is the name of that like weird wild missile storm that is so famous mm -hmm. from these from these shows and those look incredible but when i think about like this is a mech that skates around i still just want it to be a mech like um like the heavy gear ones or like in code geass where they, <laughs> so i say the lancelot the, the Lance, like yeah I, it's I a think, cool mech it's a cool the mech. lancelot's a cool mech it's a cool mech for, uh, for, for season one and then they put too much shit on yeah it, agreed it's bad again. agreed <laughs> um but like i yeah but i think you're totally right i think there's a cool effect of like robots like leaning up against destroyed buildings and then something flies past them low to the ground uh i, I like it it's good uh, each Joe and Fokker show up just in time to save Minmay from getting stepped on uh, by one of the walkers. Each Joe picks her up uh, in uh, Gerwalk mode and flees with her still in the mech's hand. Uh, he tries to talk to her from his cockpit, but she's on in the hand of a Gerwalk and can't understand what he's saying. Uh, and just is like holding on for dear life as he tries to give her instructions. Uh, Fokker contacts him and is like, I would, die if you want, but make sure you get the girl home all right. Uh, and then each Joe remembers that his plane has two seats, uh, just as he's uh, attacked with missiles and flies up and tries to avoid them. This is the scene you were shouting out with the really cool missile mm -hmm, animation. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's such um, a cool scene. His arm, the arm of the Gerwalk gets shot off and begins to fall. And they're like way up above the cloud cover now. And he dives down and you get this absolutely stunning worth watching this entire show for this one yeah. scene of animation where the arms falling. She falls climbs out of the arm as they go through the cloud cover and then spins around the falling plane rotating as he opens the cockpit and grabs onto her and pulls her inside and it's just exceptional 
Yeah, it's it's a fantastic scene, and I want to have a little context here in that before I watched this episode, you came into the Slack channel uh, and were like, holy shit, holy shit, Macros, you have to watch it right now. <laughs> and I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. But then uh, a bunch of alien bulls landed, uh, they destroyed the entire city, <laughs> and this scene happened? And I was like, well, that must be what you were talking about. <laughs> yeah, um, it so wasn't. At this, it so was. at this point, this has all happened. I am fully satisfied. I think we're good. I think the episode is done, and everyone's going to... Can kind of, um, uh, you know just get back on the ship and go to space, and that's that's what the episode is. That's not what happens. What happens in the final two minutes of the episode? Well, so so before that, we get maybe the most endearing <laughs> thing I've seen in a mech show, as yes. they're like panting and upset in the in the cockpit now that they have survived, and he she's she's like fixing her hair, and uh, he's like, "Oh, are you more worried about your hair or your life?" And then she's like, "Oh, my hair, of course." And then she laughs at herself, at, like because it's a joke and he laughs at her because it's a joke and it's just like a human moment between two friends like people who are like going to be friends clearly probably romantic interests knowing anime uh and it's not like oh the girl's just concerned about girly things that would be in most of the other shows we have watched up to this point yes imagine it's just if a good Nina human moment. and co had ever had any moment as oh, good as oh my like god <laughs> uh, yeah no it's a whole new world just writing people like people uh, in the middle of having this conversation, they don't notice that there is a walker right in front of them, and the Valkyrie crashes through the legs of the walker and uh, like land, like skitters to a land as the walker's knocked over. Minmay's knocked out, so she doesn't have to see what's happening next. Uh, <laughs> Ichijo dumps the entire clip uh, of his gun into the walker, which just shreds it. And I'm like, man, this got really violent and like horrific with like some of that uh, 0080 uh -huh. like animation of the pod being ripped apart. And and so the pod collapses. It's like, oh, that was that. And then the back pops open, and the enemy they're fighting comes out, which is a a giant man, a giant man in a <laughs> and not like in a robot suit. It's just a giant man. It's just a thirty foot tall man. Dude, well, like they get you <laughs> twice, right? Because like the the mech opens up, the back of yes, this pod so opens up. My my notes my notes here are uh, enemy combatant climbs out, and it's a man in a robot suit. Wait a second, what is even happening? This is a giant man. Uh, yes. It's like a purple suit gets out and like the the first time you're it, it would be totally feasible like, "Oh, there's another mech inside that mech." And then he takes off his his helmet and it's just like, "Dude, it's just a dude. It's just a because dude." Be, be, before they show his head, they show his foot slamming down and it's a giant like boot, like a yes. giant like mech boot. It looks like it could be a mech suit, but then it's a giant man. <laughs> You need to see his face. You gotta go look up this episode and see his face. Because it's it's not like, oh look at this ridiculous alien. No, just a guy. Look at him, just a guy. He's just got a got out from work. <laughs> he steps on a car, he walks over yes. and and uh, Ichijo is just shook. It's just all the way terrified yeah. at what he is seeing. <laughs> <laughs> and so this giant man is stumbling towards the plane to attack it and it suddenly like the the giant is shot from behind and again it is the animation of things just getting torn up but now it's a person who is just being shot multiple times in the back as like blood's erupting from his chest and it, the giant collapses and it's Fokker who comes up to Ichijo and is like ah yeah I meant to tell you the battle droids are built to fight giants I'd never seen one I didn't expect them to look like this I did know they were giants though and didn't tell you that <laughs> uh, uh, yeah and then he's like doesn't he go like oh we're never gonna get back on the spaceship because we've got to leave and Ichijo is just fucking not having any of this existing right now yes yeah, so yeah they all like the Macross is ready to take off they're gonna use the rockets this time to get them into space uh good old reliable fuel rockets as the Macross takes off uh, each Joe and Fokker are both taking off to head back to Macross, but the narrator is like, uh, Hikaru Ichijo has now learned the nature of true terror. As we reach the end. <laughs> sure has. Oh my god, who is that big man? <laughs> who is that big man? <laughs> who is it? Uh, so this. Uh, uh -huh. We've joked before. Uh, we joked before. Is like, oh, it's a shame we're probably never going to watch another '70s show because we really miss the '70s aesthetics. So, opening this show, which I thought was going to be like the cool '80s like Top Gun anime, and seeing that it's actually a '70s show, basically because it's '82, so of course it looks like a '70s yep. show was beyond my wildest uh, imaginations of what Macross is going to be. But then it happens to be like a show with characters I like, and a giant steps out of the robot. <laughs> God. 
Uh, it's on another level. I can't imagine swinging out of the gate harder than, yo, it's a giant guy. Just a giant man. <laughs> Here he is. And now he's dead because we shot him because he's a <laughs> mechs, man. Mechs are a metaphor for the human body. <laughs> Except, I yeah, yeah, exa- yes. Yeah. Like, I, ugh, when people go like, what do you mean? <laughs> ah, it's Macross. <laughs> it's not even, it's not even like, oh, oh, if you'd only watched the 2012, you know, OVA of blah, blah, blah. No, it's Macross. They do it immediately. <laughs> <laughs> so it, ma- it made me think about every time I've been like sold on Evangelion. It's like, no, what if the mechs were like real bodies? And they're like, and I'm like, uh huh. And then you go back to the '82 <laughs> and watch this. And it's like, it's not deconstructing anything. That's a giant man. Uh-huh. <laughs> that is a oh, giant wow. man. He's standing there, uh, and Ichijo is just comatose with trauma. <laughs> yes, human saw giants, and we're like the only way we could fight those is to also be giants. We need big bodies. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, good. Yeah. I'm so ready. Uh, um, the one what thing, a wild premise. The thing I want to note that we didn't really call out is there's like some special effects in these episodes that are incredible because yeah. they are like practical effects using uh, 80s like animation techniques. It's like uh, the closest thing I can I can compare it to to something in my own life is like seeing vector graphics for real and not mm-hmm. just like a video of vector graphics, but the sort of brightness mm-hmm. and light um, of the it's it's in the intro. It's like when it's in the intro and then it's when the enemy ships first arrive, um, where they're like coming through hyperspace or whatever. It feels like yes. the film stock is burning. It's great. Yes. Uh, you know, we don't really talk about the next on as much, but yeah. next on implies that we're going to get a lot more of that uh-huh. next episode. So yes. uh, I'm ready. I'm ready. Uh, there's just like a like the so the thing like I don't think I probably like Super Robot. I haven't watched a bunch of it. But the thing I like about that era of sci fi is like the sense of the uncanny about the weird things that come from space. It's why I really like Gunbuster, because it mm. puts it in a context I can understand where like the robots are real. They're doing push ups to get stronger. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good gag. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, but seeing this, we're like a mysterious ship dropped and now new aliens are coming and we don't even know what they look like. And the most horrifying answer is they're us, but huge. Oh, <laughs> uh, just is like a deep weird in this show that I thought was going to be like the kind of goofy Gundam send up that I wasn't like, it just knocked me on my ass. Yeah. I was so impressed with these two episodes. Yeah. They definitely had like a, cause I was thinking a lot about space battleship Yamato watching these, um, which doesn't do giants, but it does have a thing where you hear about aliens in the first couple episodes and then it just cuts to the aliens and they're just people like all the aliens are just people in that show. <laughs> they just happen to come from other planets. Um, but they're not huge. They are normal. Well, I actually don't know. I never see them in the same room as people. Maybe they could walk out and also be huge, but I they're doubt tiny. it. They're tiny. That's the, that's the <laughs> they're twist. Tiny, they're tiny. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, it's definitely, it's, it's, it's definitely cool. And it, it justifies like, um, how weird and crappy the aliens look at the start of the show uh with like the weird um dracula guy right yeah uh because that's it's a weird aesthetic and it definitely puts you in the frame of mind for just oh we're just gonna have cartoon villains and they're all gonna go into space and then a giant man steps out uh and the entire framework is broken and anything could happen <laughs> yeah uh, but yeah that's macros very excited um, that is a much longer episode than you're probably going to get usually. <laughs> yeah, no, I. Uh, yeah. There was a lot going on here. Uh, it sure is. Eventually, um, eventually, the uh, the Gundam team is just going to need salt, and they're going to be looking for salt, and that won't be a very long <laughs> story. <laughs> oh yeah, no, we're back in the seasons, so we can we're back in fifty long episodes, uh, yeah. so we can just you know have some nothing happen there from time to time. Yeah. That'll be fun. It'll be fun to just have like a short episode or, or where it is just, you know, fun filler. Oh, remember when this podcast was 30 minutes long every week? <laughs> I do. I do remember that. Um, it was a much worse show, to be fair. So, yeah, but now it's our job. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh, but I guess that's it. I guess we're done with I the podcast. Yeah. Austin, where can we find you on the internet? <laughs> you can find me at Austin underscore Walker on Twitter. I also do stuff over at waypointadvice.com and at um, uh, Friends of the Table. Friends, of, friends underscore Table on Twitter. Friends of the Table dot cash to support that Patreon. Uh, we just did a postmortem for Bluff City, which is our kind of like modern day Earth uh, game instead of being a purely future or fantasy game. Um, and we're also gearing up to do our next mech season. Uh, 
uh, which will be season six. And you can, you can, if you're a patron, you can hear um, a thing called Road to Season Six, which are like little one shots that are kind of building the 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 path between our last mech season and the upcoming one. So they're very good. Thank you. I like them. Thank a lot. you so much. Um, also, people should go watch, listen to, be good, and rewatch it. A podcast that has been canceled. Oh, you want to talk about hate. things I love? <laughs> God, I'm fucking. Yeah. You know. Go listen to that. I'm. People should go listen to it. We we didn't do any mech stuff ever, did we? But we no. did do. We did the purge. We did the entire purge series. We talked a lot of shit about uh, M Night Shyamalan movies. Um, yep. There's a, a little uh, kind of space horror r- run of um, that Patrick and Danielle did. That was what was that? That was Sunshine and uh, Event Horizon. We did an eight yeah. part Jane Austen run. Uh, that's yeah. the one. That's, if you yeah. listen to nothing else, listen to that. I really, really enjoyed doing that. And then we did an episode on us to wrap it up. Uh, and so you can yes. go listen to that. It's called be good and rewatch it. Uh, if you want to support us, uh, you, uh, once again, reminding everyone, they can go to patreon.com slash normal mapping. Uh, $1 a month gets you episodes like this uh, every week. Um, we will continue to watch victory and Macross uh, for the next six months. Looking forward to it. <laughs> yep. We finally just strapped in. We have another six month long show to do. <laughs> oh, it's so nice to just have a long one ahead. Um, and uh, if you go to abnormalmapping.com, you can see the rest of our shows. Uh, we're going to have a new one launching very soon, which Ooh. I'm very excited about. Uh, that'll be free. There's a game club if you want to listen to us talk about video games. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on. So please check those things out. Um, yeah. I guess that's it. Podcast over. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye. Do wait? What do you do? We can we start doing Makuros now instead oh, yeah, of yes, Gundam? Yes. I mean, literally every time I just like have an idle moment to myself, uh, I'm going Makuros. Ooh, it's so good. <laughs> it's incredible. Uh, it's incredible. <laughs>